Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this allows my content to get in front of more people. And thank you for that. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition and I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing and it often starts with the carnivore cures all meat elimination diet. Today I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Thomas Seafried. He is all things cancer and cancer research. Dr. Thomas Seafried is a professor of biology at Boston College. He has over 200 peer-reviewed publications and literally wrote the book on cancer as a metabolic disease on the origin, management, and the prevention of cancer. Dr. Seafried published a groundbreaking treatment called the Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, and he talks through a lot of how to support cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease rather than a genetic disposition. Dr. Seafried and I talk about so many things related to cancer, the origins of it, why we think it's more of a genetic illness than is a metabolic illness, and how oftentimes metabolic therapy is the way to go when you start cancer treatment. We talk about mitochondrial health and how oxygen is so very much needed in order for the body to thrive. We talk about how sometimes even all of the cancer causing toxins may not be as important as a diet and lifestyle alone. One thing that Dr. Seafried said offline to me was that when you see headlines that say died from cancer complications or complications from cancer, it's often because of the medications and treatment to cancer. So yes, there are a lot of people that die from the actual interventions of cancer, such as chemotherapy and the medications or radiation itself. It's so fascinating, but he says oftentimes it is the medication that is killing the patient instead of the cancer itself. You will learn so much about how diet and lifestyle affects cancer, especially since cancer didn't really exist a couple hundred years ago. I hope you enjoy this interview. Let's get right into it. Hi, Dr. Seafried. I'm very excited to have you today. Thank you for joining me today. And for the people that may not know you, I've heard of you yet. If you can introduce yourself and what got you into the field that you are researching. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Judy. It's nice to be here. I'm a professor of biology at Boston College. I teach uh, uh, advanced uh, seniors and graduate students in cancer metabolism. And I also teach undergraduates who are not bio majors. Uh, I teach general biology. I've been working on um, metabolic approaches to cancer for more than two, two and a half decades, three decades, actually. And uh, we worked in the epilepsy field for years uh, before we got into the cancer field, working with ketogenic diets, calorie restriction for managing seizure disorders in children. Um, uh, But at the same time, we had parallel research on uh, cancer biochemistry. But it's only when we started to move from the epilepsy field into the cancer field that we could explain how these uh, metabolic dietary approaches to cancer uh, can be explained quite quite easily, but we're still clueless, not clueless, but certainly have no clear idea of how metabolic therapy stops epileptic so, uh, seizures in children. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for cancer, it becomes uh, completely clear. Uh, we also realize that epilepsy is debilitating a disorder as it is, doesn't often lead to the death of the patients. Uh, whereas in cancer, um, you know, it's uh, people are fear stricken and many, 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 many people are dying from a disease where they don't need to die, that the death is doesn't necessarily have to be one of the outcomes uh, for this condition. So we're developing new therapies to treat cancer patients uh, that will be non-toxic and, and very powerful. Um, it's just that a lot of people don't know about it, e- either in the medical schools or in the lay public. They just they just don't know about about this stuff. Let's take a step back um, and talk really about cancer. So what really is cancer? When I was growing up, I always heard cancer was it's either in your genetics or it's not. And if it's your family has cancer, then you probably will get cancer. But nowadays, it doesn't seem like it's just genetics. So maybe if you can tell us, you know, what really is cancer? Well, well, the definition, the definition of cancer is cell division out of control, cells that are no longer uh uh, re- regulated in their in their growth, so people say, "What is cancer? Cell division out of control." 
Right. Uh, what what is responsible for the uh, cell division out of control? And the answer is uh, a transition from uh, respiration, uh, energy through oxygen to to energy through fermentation. Um, the the misinformation that the that has happened for the last five or seven decades is that there are gene mutations. Uh, there are gene mutations in cancer, uh, but they're but they're downstream. They're they're not the cause. They're the effect. Okay. So when when the cell can't get energy through oxygen, the oxygen enters the cell, but creates um, reactive oxygen species. Uh, they call them ROS, reactive oxygen species. The uh, the hydroxyl and oxygen radicals, and they cause mutations. So the mutations that you see in cancer are the effect of the inability of the cell to use oxygen for energy. So uh, those things are are carcinogenic. They they lead to the formation of cancer, and they are mutagenic. That is, they cause mutations. So the mutations that you see in cancer are coming from the inability of the cell to generate energy through oxygen. They take in oxygen but they don't use it to generate energy. They make these reactive oxygen species. So the field, unfortunately, has been chasing the downstream effects of the cancer problem for decades. And uh, this has not shown any major advances in managing the disease. We have over 1,600 people a day dying from cancer. In China, it's 8,100 a day dying from cancer. So it's a devastating disease and we're spending millions of dollars and we're creating tremendous toxicity and mutilation of the cancer patients when it doesn't have to happen because it's some mindset, I call it ide um, uh, ideological dogma that makes everybody think it's a genetic disease when in fact it's not. So, and this can explain why we have this cancer crisis today. And it's very hard to change the system. Locked in systems are very, very difficult to change, even when you have the evidence to support everything I'm saying. Right. Um, it's just very hard to change a, a, someone's political uh, affiliation or religion. Uh, these things, it, it's very hard to change the human mind when dogma controls the uh, neural circuits in the brain. So, uh, um, and that's unfortunately where we are in this cancer thing. Um, even though we have the evidence to show that metabolic therapy is the best uh, approach to managing the disease, uh, oh no, people can't use it because it's not sanctioned by the establishment. Um, so the question is, why is that? Why why would the establishment not sanction a, a therapy that actually works and it's based on the origin of the disease? So that's what that's what we all have to think about. You know, what's responsible for that? What about the War Warburg study? So that's like something that I always hear in terms of cancer. And how does it relate to everything you just talked about? Well, Otto Warburg uh, was the 20, 20th century's one of, one of the great scientists of the 20th centuries of the 20th century. And he long ago said cancer starts from damage to uh, respiration okay. and that the uh, cell that can ferment is able to ferment, use an ancient form of energy that doesn't require oxygen. Those are the cells that can become cancer cells. And, and he was absolutely correct about that. Um, the problem is if Otto Warburg is correct, then most of the field is incorrect. So what do we do? We have to now say that Otto Warburg must be wrong because the entire field can't, can't be wrong. But uh, as Warburg said, a cell, if you take, a, if you gradually remove the ability of a cell to generate energy by breathing oxygen, um, but that cell has to have an alternative for, source of energy, otherwise it's going to die. So that alternative source of energy is the ancient pathway of fermentation, which is the generation of energy without oxygen. And all the cells in, in on our planet were fermenters before oxygen came into the atmosphere 2.5 billion years ago. So the cancer cell is doing nothing more than falling back on a fermentation metabolism. And what Warburg said, it was all due to glucose. And uh, they're fermenting glucose. And I and I and we've come along and said, no, they also ferment the amino acid glutamine. They ferment glucose and glutamine. We don't know of any cancer cells that can survive without glucose and glutamine. So, but who, but no one's targeting these two fuels. So when you don't target the fuels that are driving the cancer, you know, you, you run the possibility of making it worse and people die as the result of this. 
So what is the best way to protect ourselves? I mean, if it's truly a oxidation or an oxygen lacking issue, if we were to reduce glucose, which a lot of the carnivores do, can cancer cells also survive? Let's say there's not a lot of glucose, but there's sufficient amounts of glutamine. Yeah, well, you know, we, we have to have drugs to target the glutamine. There's no okay. food. For whatever reason, I, I just don't understand. I've said it like thousands of times. People say, um, what can I eat to reduce my glutamine? You know, they're always saying, like I, I said, you need a drug. Say it. We need a drug. We need a drug. Yes. And those drugs can be very powerful if used correctly. We know what they are. We already have them. They're already available. Uh, but the problem is they're... They're not available to the cancer patients, mm. um, at least the ones that really work well. Uh, there, there are there, the, the pharmaceutical companies are building glutamine targeting drugs, none of which work as powerful as the one they that is not al not allowed to be used. So, um, which is six deoxynorleucine. You can look up my papers. We describe okay. all of these drugs. So you need to take away the glucose with diet uh, and raise ketones, and then you bring in the glutamine targeting drugs. And together with those two uh, and, and raising ketones, which the tumor cells can't use, uh, you can then manage the disease. We've, we've published some beautiful papers showing the complete mechanism and strategy. And we're working on a big treatment protocol right now uh, that hopefully we publish and we'll tell everyone with especially glioblastoma with brain cancer, how to manage their cancer without toxicity. So uh, um, we'll publish that. And then uh, it's up to the uh, medical schools to determine whether or not they want to use it. But I tell you, if the, if the general public knows that this can save them, they'll take the protocol to the top medical schools and say, I'd like you to do this treatment for me. And right. then, then it becomes like, well, you either going to do it or you're not going to do it. You talked about glucose. You know, there are other forms of sugar that, you know, I think Dr. Richard Johnson has also found that, you know, for example, fructose can convert to glucose. So would it mean that all carbohydrates should be restricted or would, do no. you focus specifically on glucose? Yeah. Well, um, uh, fructose has some glucose. Right. Um, and um, like table sugar, table yes. sugar, we have fructose, half gl uh, glucose. Right. Uh, fructose takes a little bit longer, but yeah, you don't have to, I, I would avoid it, but I don't, I wouldn't say it's as powerful. It's not as uh, but do we really need fructose? What are we taking fructose in for in the first place? Uh, if there, if you have a little bit of a fruit, sure. Okay. Now you have to realize that the fruits that we're eating today are massively enriched with with glu with with glucose. They're right. very sweet, yes. right? This is not the way these we've engineered them to be loaded with carbohydrates. Right. This is not the original apple and the original uh, what our ancestors ate. You know, they would get a, a small apple, which was this big, about the size of a plum, and they would have to wait for it to ripen before you could get any sweetness out of it. Um, a lot of vitamin C in there, but the, but the sweetness, yeah, but today's fruits are loaded with the, they're not the same fruits that we evolved to eat. They're engineered to be super high in carbohydrates. But the one thing we used to know for the epilepsy, epi patients with epilepsy is that the grapefruit uh, had a low glycemic index. And that's another thing. We don't know. Whatever you eat, we use the Keto Mojo uh, glucose ketone meter. So if someone says, oh, you know, I can eat a big orange and not spike my, my well, then eat the orange. Uh, but if you eat the orange and you, and you find out your GKI goes way up, uh, then don't eat that orange. Right. I mean, er everything that you think you should eat, test it first on your body. Your body may be different than mine. I don't know. Um, but people say, oh, can I eat this? Can I eat a big steak? And can I do this? Eat the steak and see what it does to your GKI. If it doesn't raise your GKI, then that should be fine. But if you raise your GKI, then you shouldn't eat that kind of a steak. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I, no, I completely agree. And um, I found that if people were to eat less amounts of steak in one sitting, then it can help keep the GKI number still high. And for the people that don't know what a GKI well, you want is. Low, you want low GKI. You sorry, low, low GKI. Sorry, yeah, I, I was thinking low, ketones. You want low so. blood sugar and you want elevated ketones. Yes. Yes. That's, and, that's the key. Right. And I find that if people eat less protein in maybe one meal, especially if people want the GKI number to be low or the high ketones, low blood glucose, but they have multiple meals and it may be better yeah. to do, do it that way. Yeah. I mean, everybody, we, we tell everybody to get into the, uh, the zone. Uh, the best way to do that is go for a week or two on, on a zero carbohydrate diet. 
Uh, you can eat meat and you can eat fish and you can eat uh, low glycemic vegetables. Uh, and then and then your body is starting to transition away from sugar as opposed to doing cold turkey, just, you know, water only fasting. And then you can jump into a once you've done a couple of weeks of zero carb diets. And believe me, it's not easy. People say, oh, I can do that. No, yeah, you go see how hard it is. You'd be surprised. You'd be, you'd be looking for that cake and that cookie. The the But then you would jump into water only fasting. And then that's when you throw, we'd put the drugs, uh, the glutamine targeting drugs okay. uh, on that because now the tumor cells are extremely vulnerable to killing and you can kill them with lower, far lower doses of drugs. So there's minimal toxicity. Interesting. Yeah, uh, it works beautifully. Don't forget the body is an incredibly healing machine. If you give it the opportunity to heal and do things the right way, these cancer cells are at great risk for elimination. Um, but you're not, it's gonna be much harder to do that, if you use drugs that poison people, uh, no one should ever have to lose. What do you? Why do people go bald uh, from cancer treatments? You're, you're designing. You're going to try to kill the tumor cells, not make kill the hair cells. That tells you that some. Every time you see somebody with a bald head, they were treated by someone who is clueless as, as to the underlying cause of cancer. So it's a real statement of of lack of knowledge when you see all these bald headed cancer patients. Um, cause to kill cancer cells with metabolic therapy, you don't lose your hair. Right. <laughs> That's for sure. And so you see all these things and, you know, if you take a radiation into your body, your blood sugar goes up, your corticosteroids go up, your sugar goes up, you get systemic inflammation. Why would anyone want to do that? Uh, now I'm not saying we have to eliminate radiation for all cancer because there's some cancers that can get 95 or more percent cure with small dose of radiation on a specific target. I mean, if that's what's the case and you don't deal with a lot of systemic toxicity, then you want to keep those kinds of procedures. But for a lot of people, um, this is like torture. You're taking human beings and uh, irradiating and treating them with drugs that are very toxic. This is a statement of lack of knowledge uh, on the part of the establishment to do something like that when we don't have to do that. Uh, we have metabolic therapy that can achieve the same goal without doing any of that. Now, it's not easy. Sure. Right? I mean, it's much easier to sit in a chair and have someone nuke your body, right? Or hook you up with a port and put toxic chemicals into your body. You don't have to do anything. You can sit there in a chair and read a book or something. But when you do metabolic therapy, you have to take charge of your own health. You're going to be a, a major participant in the management of your of your cancer. So it's And some people don't like that. They want the doctor to do everything. Please just do what you need to do. And then if it doesn't work, what do they do? They say, oh, you're supposed to work. Well, it didn't work. So what are you going to do? You can't blame anybody, but the, but, but you blame yourself for, for letting some guy treat you who, who didn't understand the nature of the disease. So it's a real tragedy for a lot of people, unfortunately. And, you know, when you see how many people are damaged from the treatments, it's just, it's just unbelievable. Even the people that are so-called cured. Oh, I got my cancer. I cured my cancer. But now I've got cardiovascular disease emotional disturbances, hormonal imbalances, all kinds of bone issues, heart issues. I mean, you've got another new set of problems that you, oh, I don't have cancer anymore, but you know, I got cardiovascular disease. I could be dead any minute from a heart attack, you know? So, uh, so you're putting yourself at risk for all kinds of other things when in case, when, when it doesn't need to be done that way. So just to be clear, if I was diagnosed with cancer and I don't know if being at a certain stage matters in your therapy, but if it was stage one or stage four, but you would have me or you would recommend doing a metabolic therapy over chemo or radiation. And except for some of the nuanced ones that you talked about with radiation and hyper targeting, but otherwise, would your first recommendation be to do a metabolic therapy if I was diagnosed? No, no it's not whether you're diagnosed. It's whether I'm diagnosed. Okay. What am I going to do if I'm diagnosed with cancer? Okay, fine. Fair you enough. look very young. You look very young and healthy. Your, your probability of getting cancer anytime soon. There's a lot of people that get uh, breast cancer really early nowadays. They do. They do. Yeah. So, so as I said, the first thing we do is we take a comprehensive blood work. Okay. Okay. And a lot of people who have cancer now, not a lot, but many, many. Let's put it. Let's put it this way. They are imbalanced in many ways. Some of them have type two. A lot of people with cancer, uh, uh, type two diabetes rolls mm -hmm. into cancer. Diabetes has now replaced smoking as the uh, one of the great risk factors for cancer. So oh, people wow. stop smoking, they get fat, they get cancer now. They, all you did was replace one risk factor with another risk factor. Right, right. Yeah, so a lot of, a lot of folks uh, have metabolic imbalances already seen on a, on a comprehensive blood work. 
you know, you can look at C-reactive protein. You can, you can look at triglyceride levels. You can look at a lot of variety of markers. Many people have parasites and they didn't even know it. We have to clean up the blood work. We have to clean up the patient uh, at the beginning. So the patient knows, oh, you can, oh, okay, if you have pristine blood work, uh, now we just put you on the meta, on the uh, keto mojo, get your get your, get yourself into a low glucose ketone index. And as soon as the the glu glucose ketone index reaches two point zero or below, is when we'll, we'll then we'll administer the glutamine targeting drug, and uh, we'll do that with embendazole, fenbendazole. These are parasite medications. Okay. They're very non toxic, but they slaughter these tumor cells. But they work much better when the body is in therapeutic ketosis. So the body has to be in therapeutic ketosis first, and then we attack with low doses of very of 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 non toxic drugs, so uh, um, it's a beautiful strategy. It works on the majority of people. Like anything, nothing works ever on a hundred percent of all people. One thing we have not yet found, at least I haven't heard about, no one has died prematurely from metabolic therapy. Uh, this is very different from uh, immu the immunotherapies that you hear about advertised all the time. CAR T. Uh, PDL1, Optivo, Keytruda, okay. all these kinds of things, you have a 20% chance of being killed by the medications. Huh. 16 to 20%. We have never seen metabolic therapy kill anybody. So, um, you know, people all think they, oh, you know, I got to suffer and pay a lot of money for something and, and it may not work. So, uh, and then they, I get hundreds of people come to me, oh, CAR T didn't work, Keytruda didn't work, this didn't work. Uh, the tumor got shrunken and then we got spots all over the body. It metastasized. Why? The tumor cell can't live without glucose and glutamine. Why, 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 why are you doing something else that allows the tumor? Oh, they're tough. They can escape. After you've been irradiated and poisoned, your body starts producing large amounts of sugar that rescue the tumor cells. Yeah, this is what happens. Say, oh, they're not tough. The, the, the treatment's made available, the very fuels that they need to survive. So it's not surprising to me why, in fact, I'm surprised we don't have more than 1,600 people a day dying compared to in, in light of what we're doing to these poor sure. folks. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real a tragedy. It's a tragedy. If someone that's listening and watching wants to get access to the glutamine and then maybe they go to their doctor and they are, their provider, their oncologist is not for this metabolic therapy, yeah. where yeah. can they find support to get the glutamine and do the metabolic. Yeah. Therapy well, that's route. a problem. You know, right. uh, we yeah. have to change the system. Uh, those guys should know okay. um, this, this, the, the, okay. So we have a lack of knowledge. They've never heard of it. Sure. Okay. So we have to excuse them for their lack of knowledge because they don't read the scientific literature and they might not even understand what they read in the first place. Okay. A greater problem is those who do know that it works and choose mm -hmm. to tell them not to do that only after the radiation and chemo fail. That's immoral. Right. And, um, uh, and believe me, that can happen too. I believe so it. Uh, the first step is metabolic therapy always, in my okay. opinion. If metabolic therapy is not getting the job done completely, you may want to combine that with a low dose of conventional approaches, which may give you a better opportunity. You don't go into the attack the tumor uh, with highly toxic and poisonous uh, chemicals at the beginning. It's like the bull in the china shop. You can make the situation worse. Yeah, you could. There's a lot of people who have their cancer completely eliminated. Uh, by these treatments. I'm not saying this is a death sentence for everybody, but as I said, you pay a lot of damage, you pay a lot of a price. Right. Your health, your body's health suffers as the result from being exposed to these kinds of treatments. No one I know goes to a health spa to say, can you give me some radiation and chemicals, toxic chemicals to make me healthier? Nobody does that, <laughs> right? But if you have cancer, that's what they do. Right. <laughs> Makes no sense, right? So, so yeah, you want to do metabolic therapy. At least I would. Um, I'm not saying this is my and and we're 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 developing a system to allow cancer patients who want to do that to have the opportunity to do that. They should they should be told by the oncologist that here's our plan, but there is other plans out there that you might want to consider and let the patient make the choice. You know, so uh, but that's not happening in any major medical school at all. So there's a lot of firewalls to block what I just said. 
um, you know, the poor patients go down and they say, oh, you know, I want to try ketogenic metabolic therapy. Oh, there's no evidence to support that. Uh, oh, we don't do that here. You know, so they get brushed off. Right. And if the patient persists, they say, oh, we'll go find somebody else. I don't want you to be my patient. So they're dissuaded. They're, you know, and, and that's not right. That's simply not right. People should have the opportunity to know from a knowledgeable practitioner what the options are. I mean, there's not just one shoe fits all. Sure. I mean, these, guys, these guys should know about metabolic therapy. And all, every oncologist in, in the country and the world should know about metabolic therapy and read the literature to see, oh, there's no clinical trials. It can't be good if there's no clinical trials. Well, who's going to do the clinical trial? Why don't you do a clinical trial and find out for yourself? Oh, it can't do that because it costs a lot of money to do a clinical trial. So why are we going to do a clinical trial on something that's not going to generate a lot of revenue? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So the people themselves have to be aware of it. Um, they have to know about it. And scientific literacy is an important part of this. You know, I'm, I'm sorry to say that. I mean, people need to need to know about certain things. And uh, it's not that complicated. The cancer cell cannot live without glucose and glutamine and cannot burn ketones or fatty acids for, for, for energy. So you know what they, you know how to trap and kill them. So there's no, um, so there's no cancers that can survive off of fatty acids and ketones. We haven't found one yet. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe there is. Uh, people say there is, but when you look at the data, they had plenty of glucose and glutamine uh, in the environment okay. with the fatty acids. Interesting. In there. Yeah, fatty acids can uncouple the mitochondria, which means they, they, they'll. They, it, it, you can indirectly increase the use of glucose and glutamine by the action of the fatty acid, mm -hmm. which then makes it look like the tumor cell is using the fatty acid. But but what happens is the fatty acid is making the tumor cell use more fermentation, uh, glucose and glutamine. So then people get they they don't know how to interpret their data. If, if, if they do what we do, we're in the lab all the time testing this stuff. We're always trying to find the tumor cell that can live without glucose and glutamine. We haven't found one yet. So um, I'm not saying there's no tumors, no cancer that can't survive on fatty acids and ketones, but I haven't found one yet. So, uh, and the ones that they say they can, they will always have glucose and glutamine in the microenvironment somewhere. So, you know, it's just, it's just one of these things. Everything we test, you know, slaughters these tumor cells when you target glucose and glutamine. So I don't know, maybe there's some resistant cancer somewhere, but I don't know about it. So if I'm understanding you correctly, if my diet and lifestyle were dialed in, I'm really eating a almost zero carb carbohydrate diet, and I am making sure my glucose is low, my ketones are high. So I'm in a ketogenic therapeutic state that essentially I should never get cancer. And I know never is always such an absolute. You know, yeah. I would say, uh, and, and, and exercise, oh, and you, you exercise. Have to throw the exercise and the ketones have to be moderately elevated. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let, uh, how what do does that know? mean? Uh, so it well, can't be two. Say, okay. Go yeah, ahead. You can go to 0 0.5 up to two millimoles. Okay. okay. You know, they're better because usually you have very low, uh, very low, especially oh, yeah. when you eat carbohydrates, right. insulin goes up and just drives, uh, you know, drives out the, uh, the, the ketones. Are, okay. Now I, I don't want to say never. Right. Uh, but our uh, Aboriginal ancestors, uh, cancer was un unheard of. It was so rare that it wasn't, nobody knew about it. And we have a medical evidence from explorers and the great um, physician, humanitarian Albert Schweitzer, who uh, examined the health, the health uh, and, and, and lifestyles of people that were in Aboriginal. Right. And he never, he never saw cancer. Uh, he remarked about it in his diaries, no cancer in these tribes. They were e eating foods and, and their, their diet and lifestyle were very similar. Uh, to the way they evolved. And same with the Eskimos. Uh, people in these natural environments, uh, cancer was rare, if if at all. And our closest relative, the chimpanzee, 98% uh, similar in gene and protein sequence. There's never been a documented case of breast cancer in a female chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. Cancer is extremely rare in, in our, our closest biological relatives. So why why us? Why are we doing, why are we so prone to cancer? And the answer is our diet and lifestyle uh, puts us at risk. What does that mean? We're eating highly processed foods. Uh, we're not exercising enough. And our glucose ketone indexes are always very high rather than low. 
So that causes systemic inflammation. It causes uh, all kinds of health issues, diabetes and all these things, all putting us at risk for cancer as well. So it's very clear. But then when you talk to people and say, you know, you, to avoid cancer, you really need to change your diet and lifestyle. Oh, people don't want to do that. <laughs> they say, is there another way? No, in fact, <laughs> there isn't. So most people would rather take the chance, roll the dice and take the chance. Uh, rather than make a radical change in lifestyle. Because you, as long as you keep your mitochondria healthy, it, it's very hard, extremely difficult to get cancer. So mitochondria burn fatty acids. Uh, the, the healthy mitochondria can burn fatty acids. They can burn ketone bodies. They can, they can survive under very low glucose conditions. That's how we evolved as a species. Our ancestors did not have a McDonald's or, or a Burger King or Dunkin' Donuts to drive up to. There, none of that existed in our in our uh, Paleolithic ancestry. Right. It was hard to get uh, food. You had to kill animals. You had to chase them down, butcher them, cook them on an open fire, grass red, free range animals. I mean, you're you're exhausted. So uh, now we just drive up to McDonald's. They, they hand you the food right through the window. Right. You, you don't even have to get out of the car to get the food. And then they wonder why I got diabetes and all kinds of other issues. Oh, I got cancer too. Oh, that shouldn't be any surprise. Why are you surprised? You know, it's it's that you have, people don't understand evolutionary biology. If they did, they they would be able to take take charge. Yeah, I, exercise keeps the oxygen coming into your body, and uh, right. eating you know meat is great. Uh, organic beef. I mean, none of our ancestors ate uh, uh, th these kinds of hormonally prepared beef. They were all eating grass fed stuff. So uh, um, and they would grab whatever they could eat. Don't forget, humans are omnivores. They can eat anything that walk, walks, crawls, or flies on this planet. They'll eat it. Uh, uh, we evolved to do that. So, it, But we were doing it in a natural environment where we sure. weren't exposed to all these chemical toxins and all these other things. So, uh, um, yeah, as far as genetic risk factors, there are genetic risk factors. Like you said, BRCA1, the, the, uh, these um, never 100% penetrant. So you have women... Okay. that have BRCA1, they never develop uh, cancer. Uh, maybe their diet and lifestyle is such a, is such a, 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 a keeping their mitochondria so healthy that even if they have the mutation, they don't get cancer. It's the ones who are in tremendous imbalance, metabolic imbalances, and then you might have a genetic risk factor that, that makes it more likely that you're going to get, the, get cancer. Um, you know, the, the, the highest one I know of is the Lee Frelmeni P53 mutation, which wears about 80% of the people with the mutation develop some sort, some sort of cancer, but it's not 100%. So again, that could be modified. If one were to know, oh, I have a P53 mutation, let me get all these organs removed. Um, or you can just uh, or, or brace yourself and get onto a, a paleolithic kind of a diet and condition. Uh, you, might, you might significantly reduce the possibility of that, of that mutation causing cancer. Or if it does cause cancer, it might be very late in your life rather than okay. early. And uh, forgetting the diet for a second, but you know, there's a lot of women that have the BRCA gene that makes you more susceptible, I guess, genetically to ovarian or breast cancer that they will then, you know, do these preventative measures of mastectomies or double mastectomies or hysterectomies. Is that a smart decision? Well, and I don't I, know. You know, uh, I know Angelina Jolie made right, that all famous right. with her decision to do this kind of stuff. And then others followed. Right. Um, but it's not 100 percent penetrant, which means okay. that the environment can play a major role as to whether that gene a risk factor, which it is, it's a risk factor. Like some people smoke. That's a risk factor. Right. Some people have the BRCA1. It's a risk factor. Um, can you modify risk? But yeah. If I stop smoking, I'm going to reduce my my probability of, of cancer, for sure. Uh, if I change my diet and lifestyle, even if I have the BRCA1, it can be modified by, by environmental uh, actions. So again, um, you know, I, I, I don't have a genetic risk factor that I know of, uh, but if I were to know that, I would certainly uh, institute uh, a, a, uh, a change in diet and lifestyle. Like some people have to do that. Sure. If you have diabetes, I mean, you, you have to be changing your diet and lifestyle uh, to, to manage that. You know, I wouldn't do it with drugs. I would do it with diet and lifestyle. Drugs are always, you always got the double-edged sword with a drug, right. you know? So, you know, it's up to an individual. See, the problem is I don't think a lot of women know what I just said. 
you know, they would have the option, you know, um, oh, should I do this or that? I'm not saying you should do one or the other. All I'm saying is you should know that uh, you you can modify uh, the risk by by making choices in your life. Right. And some people say, no, I'll get my breast removed because I don't want to make those choices. Okay. I mean, that's your choice that you did that. But it uh, doesn't mean you're not going to ever get cancer because it could strike another tissue at a much older age. Who knows? Right. You know, so it's hard to say. Right. And I think most people don't know what you're talking about with metabolic therapy. I think if people had the option of maybe not doing chemotherapy or radiation, and maybe they can do a ketogenic diet, maybe there would be a small population that would still try the diet and lifestyle first. But I think most people don't think that's an option at all. No, because they're not told that. Right. Okay. And they don't know about it. I mean, I mean, if we, if we knew about metabolic therapy when Otto Warburg and he, he, unfortunately, Otto did not know how to dovetail his cr- critical finding I- I- into a, a clinical practice. Uh, we're, we're doing that now. That's what our, I'm working with a lot of physicians and we're, mo- we're moving metabolic therapy into a clinical practice. Uh, Otto did not do that. He just defined how it, how uh, it originated and then uh, did not know nothing about the glutamine issue. So we've, I, we've uncovered that uh, that, but um, if you knew that, uh, based on our ancestral folks, uh, based on chimps and things, you knew that a certain diet and lifestyle would be it would be very rare to get cancer if you uh, didn't want to adhere to the diet and lifestyle. Um, uh, how many people would want to say, "Well, I don't want to do diet and lifestyle. I I really want radiation and toxic chemicals." It changed the direction of the approach. You know, our ancestors never had to worry about, well, they didn't have cancer, very rare. So they never had to worry about radiation and chemo. Uh, even though it wasn't developed, they, they really never had to use it anyway. So, um, but I'm not saying, you know, some parts of medicine have made almost miraculous advances, hip replacements, bone replacement. I mean, certain things are just unbelievable. But when it comes to cancer, uh, we're still in the stone age. You know, it's like, uh, what are you doing? You know, most of this stuff makes no sense. It's not supported scientifically, and yet everybody does it. So it's like one of the strangest, strangest things you can imagine. What do you think about all the things that, you know, there's a lot of chemicals and toxins in our environment where people say, oh, this is cancer causing or yeah. um, it's a carcinogen. If we eat a ketogenic diet and we really do not consume foods with a lot of sugars or fruits, even um, glucose and fructose but we are exposed to a lot of those carcinogens. Can those be enough to move the needle to ha- cause cancer? Yeah, a very, that's extreme. That study, uh, tests have been done. Okay, okay. okay. So, so, <laughs> so uh, in our, in our uh, um, uh, monkey uh, closest primates, they, okay. they did this. Okay. okay, so so the monkey eats its natural diet and uh, we know that uh, irritation uh, on the skin can can cause cancer. We, we knew that for a long time. Uh, the chimney cleaners and different occupations mm-hmm. that are that are exposed to different kinds of chemicals. So um, there was a study that was done. I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. I can't remember. It was back in the 70s, I think, where they rubbed a carcinogen on the skin of the monkey monkeys uh, for 10 years. Oh, okay. They never got cancer, but they weren't eating. Now the the control experiment should have been, let's give the monkeys uh, our diet, Western diet, uh, Western diet, and and then rub the chemical on their skin and see whether or not they would get cancer. So uh, because the monkey is in its natural environment and uh, it's eating its natural foods and uh, rubbing the chemical on the skin, which would give many Americans skin cancer uh, when they were eating a uh, Western diet and lifestyle, these monkeys were eating their diet. So, but they didn't do the control experiment. We needed to give the monkeys our diet, Western diet, and then right. rub the chemicals and then see whether or not they would. So the question about your, your comment about this, car, would carcinogens? Yeah. I think when you have a diet and lifestyle that raises blood sugar, minimal exercise, and at the same time, you're exposed to these forever chemicals and this kind of thing. Yeah. There are risk factors that could work better in inducing cancer when the body is not equipped to deal with the effects of those chemicals. So, uh, and and I I went to the uh, zoo down here in Boston, the Franklin Park Zoo, where they have a beautiful gorilla exhibit, one of the best in the country. And I asked the veterinarian, I says, you know, these guys, oh, we feed them exactly what they, they very similar to the nutrition that they have in their, in the jungle. 
and their natural environment. I says, do you ever go down and give them, you know, just out of the, see what it's like, give them a big hamburger from McDonald's. And well, the gorillas don't eat hamburgers, but they'll, but they'll eat jelly donuts. Um, they'll, they'll eat kind of like sweet stuff. Oh, she said, no, that's animal cruelty. Uh, we can't do that. Well, we're, what about us? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 and I saw there's some chimpanzees living with uh, humans down in Florida. They have a family of chimps living with humans. They feed them. And when they bring out the gel, the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, they got the gorilla, the chimpanzees are banging on the table. They're so excited. But in, in their natural environment, they don't have that. Right. And they're not going to drive down to the local. Go, leave, let's leave the jungle, go down and get a get a big bag of donuts and then come back and sit in the tree and chow them down. They don't do that. But if you took these chimps and gave them a diet lifestyle that's similar to us, they'd have diabetes, glaucoma. You know, right. they would probably have cancer rate, rates would go way up. So uh, um, it, it's our convenience and our diet and lifestyle that put us largely at risk for not only cancer, but all these chronic diseases, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease. They're all like linked together. Do you think that a carnivore diet, which is just an all meat diet is preventative enough or should, does it need to be in that ketogenic GKI ratio to be therapeutic? No, I, I mean, uh, in other words, our, what it was our, what was our diet? The paleolithic diet was largely meat, right? But it wasn't, it wasn't the kind of meat that we have in our environment today. Like, you know, tomahawk ribeyes and big these kinds of steaks are they coming from free range cows are they coming from buffalo don't forget the native plains native americans in the plains they ate a lot of buffalo meat i mean that was like one of their big things yeah but all that stuff is natural and if it's natural it, we evolved to eat all that stuff right. um some of that free range beef can be a little gamey uh a little tough if it's not prepared right yeah, people, I don't want that. I want to give me the corn fed stuff, right? I mean, oh, you know, you go down to the top steakhouses, you know, Morton Steakhouse, all the corn fed beef, aged, aged corn fed beef. Yeah, meat, uh, carnivore diet. L look at how we, it's called paleolithic. But who wants to go out and eat, uh, where am I going to get moose and buffalo and, and deer that people, you know, free range? But they also eat unnatural foods along with it. You know, a lot of the beef has, chemicals in it beef or hormones and all this kind of stuff it tastes delicious i'm not i'm not listen i'm not telling you i don't eat that i eat a big i go down to you know one of the steak houses every now and then and chow down on a big piece of beef it's delicious right. but i think uh, processed beef you know uh all that sausage stuff and you know you got to eat it very sparingly every now and then it's but you know eating a, a whole bunch of cured sausages every day it's probably not going to be very healthy I put you at risk for colon cancer or something like this. Well, well, what about the grocery store meats that are, uh, so I guess they'll be the last few months of their life, they'll be eating corn fed and gr some of the grains. So they'll get more fattened, but there's technically not a lot of glucose in meat. So is, is it the issue of the glutamine or is it because yeah, of all yeah, the. Yeah, no, it, it, you're right about there's not much uh, glucose elevation and, and I'm not saying, and that's true. Uh, the problem is, how many people eat just the 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 steak? I know. You got a big potato next to it or pasta right, right, right. or rice. I mean, forget about it. You can't have that. You want the steak? You eat only the steak. And maybe a little bit of a bro some some low glycemic vegetable that has a lot of nutrients in it. Okay. No, but none of this high carb potatoes and and oh, I gotta have a big piece of bread with that. You know, that's what's oh, I eat meat all the time, but I always have bread or something with it. Ah, uh, forget it. No, it's not gonna work that well. Right. So uh, for breakfast, I have a, a piece of lamb. For lunch, I have a small por pork. And at night, I have beef. Mm. You know, it doesn't, I know, have no potatoes, no vegetables, nothing else except meat. Do you know anybody like that? I don't know anybody like that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think a lot of the carnivore community, most of them are meat based. So maybe they have, some, I, don't, I don't know what additional things they have. Maybe they have a keto treat. I'm not entirely sure, but well, generally. I <laughs> yeah, I, I don't either. But, but if so, I eat carnivore. Oh, yeah. Is that all you eat is meat? I mean, there's got to be something else. Oh, I eat eggs too, you know, eggs. You know, uh, I, I don't know what to say. All I know is that our ancestors could eat anything they could see. Sure. And find. But it was all natural. Right. Uh, and it wasn't what we have today. So, and and our diets and lifestyles are so, uh, our diet is so delicious. I mean, you eat a McDonald hamburger. I mean, I have one at like once every year or something, one a year, maybe one every two years. It's It's tremendously delicious. Uh, and, and I know that it's not good for me, right. but every now and then I'll go out and get a McDonald's hamburger 
And believe me, they've those things are delicious. Um, people say, well, I can get another one. Yeah, there, there are other different kinds, but I, I don't think that uh, is the healthiest way to go. And I see a lot of people that eat a lot of fast food right. that are unhealthy and, and they have a lot of uh, chronic diseases and the obesity epidemic is exploding, right? So uh, our ancestors were never obese. They couldn't get fat. There was no carbohydrates in their diet to get fat. Right. And they're running around trying to kill everything all day long to get food for the family. There's no chance that anybody could be obese. It only became when we started to cultivate grains and things like this. And now today, with all the stuff that they add to the food, I mean, we've got an obesity epidemic. Right. It's linked to cancer and, and type 2 diabetes and all this stuff. And then they want you to take a pill <laughs> to, to read it. It's absurd, man. All this, but it's the easy way out. People yeah. want easy. Everybody, right. Everything has to be easy. Can I eat the big steak and, and potatoes and I'll take this pill to make it all healthy? No. How stupid can you be? Right. <laughs> That's not work. I, I do think it's funny that we feed a lot of cattle, you know, grains and corn at the end. And we know that that's how they get fattened up. And so yeah. then if we think about how we use corn and everything in human diets, well, no yeah. wonder we're gaining weight. Yeah. It's, it's just one of many things. It's not just the, the because a lot of that corn has changed corn into, into high fructose corn right, syrup. Right. And, and a lot of it's uh, mixed with other grains that have been engineered to have a lot of sugar in them, uh, high glucose. So when I say sugar, I mean, carbohydrate. So you kind of kind of re realize it, but we're in a society where convenience is a big factor. People are sitting in traffic jams and they're not exercising enough. They're sitting in front of their computer all day long. They come home, the kids are screaming. Everybody wants to eat right away. Well, let's go out, get DoorDash, comes right into your house with all the delicious foods and all that stuff. And then if you want organic beef, you got to pay twice as much for it. Right, or something. right. You know, and for a lot of folks, they don't have the money to be doing all that. Right. So you put it all together and it, the, we, we, it's very clear why we're in the situation we're in. Right. You know, as we close, are there just tips, maybe cancer is in the family or you're just deathly afraid of cancer or you've just been diagnosed or you're in a cancer treatment protocol? You know, what are some closing tips for you? Well, I, I think people just need to know that there are other alternatives to managing their cancer and they need to put the pressure if they can uh, on the establishment to say, I'd really like metabolic therapy if that's possible. Uh, you should know of the, why the lay people have to come in and tell the physicians what kind of right. therapy they want. That shouldn't have to happen. These guys are supposed to know what's going on, but it takes time. And I think that right now we're in a transition period and uh, people are starting to hear more and more about this. There's a movie uh, that will become a documentary movie on metabolic therapy. It's called The Cancer Revolution. It'll be coming out next year, which will is going to shake the foundation of this whole this whole thing, mainly because they've interviewed dozens and dozens of terminal cancer patients who have done metabolic therapy and survived quite well. Wow. Uh, and I think the word of mouth and the and the evidence, you don't need a clinical trial to see people that were diagnosed with all these horrible cancers doing well. Uh, why? If, what, what, I won't believe it until I do a formal clinical trial. And, and even after that, they won't do it. How do I know that? Because, because that's what they said about uh, ketogenic metabolic therapy for epilepsy. They said, oh, we must use drugs first. And if the drugs don't work, we're going to use ketogenic metabolic epile um, uh, therapy for ep kids with epilepsy. Uh, because we can't believe it until a clinical trial is done. So some of my colleagues got together and they did a big clinical trial on ketogenic metabolic for, uh, therapy for epilepsy. And it was extremely powerful, highly effective. And that was the evidence that should have told everybody that this is the way to go. But many parents today who have children with epilepsy, the first thing the physician will do is, is, is tell them they need to take all these drugs rather than say ketogenic metabolic therapy for epilepsy, even though the clinical trial showed it. And I can guarantee you the same thing will happen. Uh, oh, we have no clinical trials on metabolic therapy for cancer. And then after the, so many hundreds and thousands of people are doing well, they still won't believe it. So it, it, there's got to be other reasons uh, right. for this. And that's what the lay public has to think about. What are the reasons for why you would want not want to use a therapy that's highly effective and non-toxic? Why would you not want to use this therapy? 
because you're telling me there's no clinical trial. And yet I see all these smiling faces over here of people who did this and they're all doing well, didn't lose their hair. I mean, wake up. I mean, there's, everybody can't be delusional about this stuff, right? Especially when it comes to a life-threatening disease like cancer. Right, right. You know, I mean, let's be honest. So it takes time. Uh, we keep publishing our papers. Uh, we get uh, our support comes largely from philanthropy. Mm -hmm. There are a few people out there that know we are absolutely correct about what we're doing. And they're not interested in making money on what we do. They're interested in getting and supporting us so the word gets out. So more and more people can benefit and manage their cancer effectively uh, without without toxicity. And and I think that uh, it takes time. I, I, I'm not you know, I have, I have a lot of physicians where we're opening. Everybody seems to think they're they're always so surprised at how powerful it works. I, I've i never seen. Oh, I never expected anything to be shown like that. What do you mean? This is what you're supposed to see. <laughs> you're not supposed to see the cancer come back and metastasize. You're supposed to see it gone. Why? Why are you so surprised when you see the evidence and you're so surprised because they're using stuff where you don't see that. So they always see things coming back and making right. people sick. And that's what they normally see. And then when they see something uh, that's different, they're so surprised. But that should be the norm, not the exception. <laughs> right? That's a, that's the crazy part of this whole thing. It's amazing, well, isn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, well, thank you so much for everything you've shared. Very powerful. Where can people learn more about you and your studies? And um... Well, we publish most of our papers open access. So okay. all you have to do is look at my name, and go to the library, public uh, uh, library of science, PubMed, and you can see our open. Uh, they're, they're, I know they're technical, um, but <laughs> but they're open access, so anybody sure. could anybody who wants to know about the data that we publish. It's not like I'm, I'm making all this up. I mean, we publish in, in peer-reviewed scientific articles, and then uh, those who benefit from our our findings are, are encouraged, if they want, to to support Travis Christopherson's. A foundation for cancer metabolic therapies, which supports a lot of okay. our work. And uh, that keeps us going. And then we keep constantly perfecting uh, the drugs and the diets that work together so powerfully, you know, doses, timing, and scheduling to perfect and streamline this process so that it becomes uh, better, more powerful, and easier to do for, for people. And, and that's what our, that's what the forefront is right now that better diets and drugs that work together that can manage the disease in a more effective manner. Well, thank you so much for everything you do for the community and the public at large. I'll put your, um, in the show notes, I'll put some of the links to your studies as well as that foundation so that anyone that wants to support um, that they can do so. But thank you so much for all the work and just knowing that there's a different option other than chemo and radiation. Cause I think that's even in the wellness community, a lot of the people still believe that's the only way to target cancer. And I mean, this is just a breath of fresh air. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Judy. It was nice to be here. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this interview. I hope it tells you a lot about the importance of diet and lifestyle, even in serious illnesses such as cancer. Oftentimes we are scared that we will one day get cancer and we're not sure what it is that causes cancer. And we get scared. Maybe it's because of smoking or something else in our life, maybe a lot of those cancer causing toxins and chemicals. But ultimately, it sounds like the core thing we need to change is our diet and lifestyle. And as Dr. Seafried said, it's not just glucose from sugar or table sugar or glucose from certain foods. It's everything that's really a carbohydrate that can affect the glucose, fructose and all of those things that can really feed these cancer causing issues in the body. I hope this conversation gives you one more lever to root cause healing. Okay, guys, you know the drill. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye, guys.